Hi guys. Good morning. So I'm going to speak about Marble, Sparta, and of course about Febs. When we first got here four years ago, the first thing President Leibowitz did for us was bribe us. But it was a benevolent bribe. He said he would give a copy of this book to each one of us who went and hung out with him in his office. And as fun as that sounded, I actually wanted a copy of the book. <laughs> so I went, and after an hour of hanging out, we painted our nails. <laughs> we played princess. We listened to Like a Prayer. I finally got this book. It's a history of Middlebury College, and it stayed wrapped for four years until I opened it last week. And now, as a way to gather ourselves in this particular space, nothing more than that, I want to share with you what I learned about this building. So Mead Chapel, which rests at the highest point on our campus and faces east towards the Green Mountain, was designed 100 years ago, actually, in 1914, to have four exterior marble walls. But once it was built in 1916, it only had three marble walls. This one behind me was made of wood, and it still is. <laughs> so why only three marble walls? The answer is actually really boring. They ran out of money. But to the then President Thomas, this one wooden wall, it was tragic. It made this space less worthy of worship. But the marble for the three worthy walls likely came from one of the quarries of Redfield Proctor, who is the namesake of our beloved dining hall back there. But also, he was in control of 60% of the country's marble production by the 1880s. And these quarries depended upon the labor of thousands of immigrants. And at one point, these immigrants went on strike. They wanted to form a union. But Proctor, who we associate with tofu, <laughs> and paninis and chocolate milk, he had his strike breakers violently attack the workers. And then once he began evicting them from their homes, they decided to go back to work with lower wages and without a union. I know, I'm sorry for being so celebratory. <laughs> but when I read that, I was like, damn, that one wooden wall is not so bad. <laughs> I sort of like that one wooden wall. <laughs> but although not captured in this book, these four walls also hold some of our history. It is here where we gathered for convocation four years ago and witnessed that raucous ceremony on this stage. It is here where many of us actually met for the first time or on the steps out front. It is here where, we, where our, our paths crossed on our way to Proctor, the dining hall. <laughs> or we met here before we went sledding down the hill. Or we all sat here listening to the Alpenglow concert. You can buy their album online. <laughs> but the history builds today, because today we get to share it with all of our guests, those who helped us get here. And later, once we leave, people will stay in this chapel or arrive to clean it. Yes, the floors beneath your muddy boots will be mopped. So before I continue, I want to pause and take a moment of silence to appreciate the history of this building in our time and before, but also to express gratitude to all those that are sharing it now with us, those in body and in spirit. I know that all of us Febs uh, find it hard to express the depth of our gratitude for all of you who helped us get here. So this is just one moment to say thank you. So here it is.
So by my senior year, I had never read the same book twice until I took Professor Callanan's class and he introduced me to Thucydides. And it was some combination of uh, not finishing the assignments and actually loving the book that inspired me to read it again. So I took another class with Professor Chaplin, Athens and Sparta, and reopened Thucydides. And I want to talk now about what I learned about Sparta in that class, which is absolutely nothing. <laughs> the history of Sparta is really a serious problem. <laughs> the Spartans inspected each newborn for strength, and if weak, tossed it out to die of exposure. At age seven, young Spartan boys would enter military training in the Agoge, where they would prance around nakedly and fight each other to determine the strongest. <laughs> At age 12, they entered into relationships with adult males, so-called pedagogical relationships. And the women, for their part, were instructed to help the men by humiliating them in public and criticizing their bodies. But here's why the history of Sparta is a problem. <laughs> All, some, or probably none of that is actually true. In Sparta, myth and reality mix regularly. In fact, myth actually informed reality. Here's how. The leaders would literally invent traditions. They would make up a rule or some identity on the basis that it was consistent with stories about their past, stories which were clearly entirely false. And in this way, story constructed reality. You know, if a Spartan believes that to be Spartan is to be disciplined, how long does it take for that Spartan to become disciplined? It seems maybe that identity is nothing more than a story we tell ourselves. Now, we Febs, we're not that disciplined. We're definitely not violent. But with the Spartans, we share much else. Probably first is a superiority complex. <laughs> yeah. Nude prancing. And I hesitate to say this, but I can't resist because it's true. Fluid sexuality. <laughs> but what's most important is that we too have invented our own identity. And here's what it looks like. We are wildly fun. We're loving, we're happy, we're so happy. Almost, it's, it is actually painfully happy sometimes. <laughs> we can't stop smiling. Can we stop smiling? They, they, they can't stop smiling. I, I, once, I once was complaining about the rain. It might have been the last time I ever complained about the rain. Because a fab said to me, Danny, how could you complain about the rain? If it didn't rain, the trees wouldn't be so beautifully green. <laughs> I was like, that is fabby. <laughs> but we do not just find ourselves in wonderful emotional states. We also work in the bike shop. We translate at the clinic. We provide powerful critiques to tired mainstream arguments. The list goes on, and I hardly embellish it. At its core, it seems, Feb culture is about courageous acts, deep community, and heaps of love. But our history also has a problem. <laughs> All, some, or probably none of that is actually true. This whole fab thing is made up. <laughs> we are no more special, happy, smart than anybody. I mean, at its basis, 2013.5 does not even make sense. <laughs> it is a joke. This whole thing, this Feb thing is a joke. Feb culture might as well be a mirage. Nothing more than a story we tell ourselves. But 
Remarkably for us, that story became our reality. In truth, we are nothing more than 100 students who happen to arrive midway through the year, the result of a fairly uninteresting problem of limited dorm space. <laughs> Nearly 40 years ago. But that day we arrived, acting like true Spartans, we decided to believe a story. A story about what it means to be a Feb. And in doing so, we did shape our reality. And to me, this history of Feb culture is liberating, because it suggests that believing in a story is sometimes all we need to shape reality. And we can use this, because it seems that sometimes the hardest thing about getting to a better place or a better world is believing that a better world or a better place exists. And And this world we share, we know it's far from perfect. I think it's probably less perfect than library printer 242K. <laughs> and for the guests, that is seriously bad. <laughs> we all know this, and I think we all agree that this world needs a little bit of loving. So what do we Febs do? I don't know, I, have no, I, I don't know. But I have one idea. Nothing more than what we've done for the past four years. When we got here, we boldly decided to believe a story about who we are, about who we could be. And belief in that story was all it took to make it manifest. That story freed us. It freed us to act courageously, to build community, and to love each other unabashedly. Let us do the same out there. Let us believe a story. A story that we already know well. That story where people make cookies for their neighbors. That, stories where they, that story where they leave notes for their friends feeling blue. Where they share books and double ride bikes and chase sunsets and cuddle under the stars and know that community is the best resource they have. That story where they dance under the willow trees to celebrate joy and wash away pain. That story where they all feel involved in each other's happiness. And if things go awry, they forgive instead of forget. It's that Feb story, and I know you know that story. That story where dancing always means sweating. <laughs> where talking means listening. Where crying means hugging. Where friend means family. That Feb story. Let's keep believing that story. It's that story where people act courageously, where they cherish community, and where they love everyone who comes their way. Let's believe that story even tomorrow, and next week, and next year, and just maybe it will once again become part of our reality. Thank you. Yeah.